Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSENG, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. This is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on NJ Spotlight News. I'm Michael Hill, in for Brianna Venosi. Just days ago, Governor Murphy hinted new restrictions due to rising coronavirus cases. Today, he made it official. Starting Thursday, bars and restaurants will have to follow new rules, including shutting down indoor dining at 10 p.m. But as the governor notes, it's not a complete shutdown like back in spring. For indoor youth sports, games go on, hold for the foreseeable future. The moves come just days after the state topped 3,000 cases in a day for the first time since May. Today, the state is reporting another 2,075 cases for a total of more than 256,000, along with 11 new deaths for a total of nearly 16,000. 500 fatalities. Hospitalizations are also up, more than 1,500 patients being treated, the highest level since June. Many restaurants already are facing the hurdle of winter taking away outdoor dining. So how is the restaurant industry reacting to the new restrictions? Senior correspondent Brennan Flanagan reports. It's not going to be good. It's not going to be good. We're probably going to barely make ends meet. Debbie Miller manages McKenna's Pub, a small bar in Lake Apakong that's usually open from 11 a.m. to 2 or 3 in the morning. But new restrictions announced by Governor Murphy would make McKenna's close at 10 p.m. And more restrictions forbidding patrons to sit at the bar leaves Miller with few options. It's going to hurt us a lot because obviously it's small in here and we don't have a lot of room to put people six feet apart. So it's going to limit us to very few people. To be clear, the last thing I want to do or any of us want to do is to shut our economy back down, and thankfully we are not at that point. Looking at the data, we are taking surgical steps that we hope will help mitigate the current increasing rate of spread. At his briefing, Governor Murphy pointed to exploding COVID-19 caseloads, more than 5,000 just this past weekend, as the science behind his new round of restrictions, which would make bars and restaurants close indoor service from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. He said cases have been traced to bar seating, but will allow tables closer than six feet if they're shielded by barriers. The new restrictions include Atlantic City's casinos. Outdoor dining isn't affected, but winter is coming, and and so state officials will permit restaurants to set up individual outdoor dining tables, each one inside an enclosed heated tent. These are the measures we are taking now, and they do not preclude us from taking further action in other areas or placing further restrictions on these in the near future. But if we do, we anticipate they will be actions, again, that are surgical in their approach. Citing cases related to youth hockey, Murphy will also ban indoor youth sports competition with out-of-state teams, including travel teams affiliated with local karate, dance, and gymnastics studios. Business leaders complained. These spikes are not being related back or contact traced back to business transactions. They're coming from social settings. And so the, the need to feel like that we're doing something proactive takes us to spaces that we can regulate. And unfortunately, that continues to take us back to the business community. We do not want the, the crazy bar situation, what we saw like this summer. But now you're going to just push these people into homes, into private homes where the kids are going to congregate, where there's no regulations, there's no oversight, there's you know no sanitation protocols. For health officials facing climbing COVID caseloads, it's a matter of pandemic survival. But for an industry uniquely vulnerable to COVID restrictions, it's a matter of economic survival. More than a third of Jersey restaurants already struggling under pandemic restrictions are expected to close this year. Some can adapt. Now with the indoor dining, we're down about 40%. 
but we've learned to reinvent ourselves, right? We reduced our menu down, we, you know, labor costs are different now. Town Square Diner owner Peter Sedarius rehired more than half the staff he had to furlough during the lockdown, and he's tightening his belt. The Wharton mainstay had already reduced its hours to close at 10, but he says responsible restaurants feel singled out. And the bad actors, there are bars and restaurants that aren't following the rules, they need to be reprimanded, they need to be punished. The people that are following the rules should be allowed to operate where they've been operating. Meanwhile, Republican lawmakers frozen out of the regulation process want the governor to schedule public hearings. Why do we allow one person under a state of emergency to make all the decisions? It just, it's absolutely wrong. Doesn't mean his decisions are wrong, but I can tell you the process is dead wrong. The governor says he consults labor and hospital leaders all the time. The new restrictions take effect this Thursday. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. A COVID vaccine that's 90% effective? That's what Pfizer says it has. It puts the company on track to ask the FDA later this month to approve emergency use of the vaccine. A big question now is who would be willing to take a vaccine? State Health Commissioner Judith Persichelli said today there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy in New Jersey, even among health professionals. She says a survey of 2,000 healthcare workers revealed 66% of doctors and 47% of nurses said they would definitely or probably take the vaccine. Science and vaccine safety were the top concerns among those professionals. The commissioner said on 60 Minutes Sunday night, New Jersey is on track to get enough of the vaccine from the federal government in the first round to vaccinate 50,000 people, but the state estimates its high risk population at 500,000. That includes health care providers. The state has an ambitious plan to vaccinate 70% of the adult population over six months, up to 80,000 people a day. Given the level of vaccine hesitancy, the department knows that an important part of our job is to share the science and the data with healthcare professionals. We want them to feel more comfortable with getting the vaccine and also recommending the vaccine to their patients once it is generally available. Physicians and nurses are trusted voices and we know they will play an important role in the public's understanding of why this vaccination is so important. The Trump campaign has threatened to sue Pennsylvania over the election as the president and millions of his supporters have refused to concede or accept the declaration of Joe Biden as president-elect. Biden accepted victory over the weekend. Joanna Gagas reports on the issues the Trump campaign might pursue and whether they'll hold any weight in the courts. Nearly a week out from Election Day and America is still mired in the same political turmoil that's pervaded the last four years. As President-elect Joe Biden takes the stage to begin planning his administration, President Trump denounces the election results, alleging fraud. In a tweet this weekend, he touted the votes he received while also saying, the observers were not allowed into the counting rooms. I won the election, got 71 million legal votes. Bad things happened, which our observers were not allowed to see. Never happened before. Millions of mail-in ballots were sent to people who never asked for them. And he's taking to the courts to prove his case. So far, he's challenging on a variety of grounds. Things like poll watchers being able to watch the count. And so in Philadelphia, he said they were too far away, and, he, and so he wanted to move them closer. Um, he's charging in other places that there were massive um, uh, dumps of, of ballots. So far, none of the cases brought in the key battleground states, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, Georgia, and Wisconsin, have shown any evidence of voter fraud for the courts to take the case. But his argument against Pennsylvania's election laws did make it to the Supreme Court. That case concerns whether mail-in ballots that are received after election day should be counted. And to be clear, these are ballots that were postmarked by November 3rd. That's correct, yes. The, the state Supreme Court ruled under the state constitution that ballots received up to three days after election day should be counted. Um, that's what the challengers brought to the U.S. Supreme Court that is still pending. Of course, it's not going to matter in Pennsylvania. Apparently, there aren't enough ballots at issue in that case for it to make a difference. The challenges in other states also don't concern enough ballots to overturn the 10,000 plus lead Biden holds in each state. The president's gotten a mix of responses from fellow Republicans. Senators Murkowski and Romney, the only ones to congratulate President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, 
Senator Ted Cruz said conceding the election at this point would be, quote, premature. And Senator Lindsey Graham, who just won a tough re-election battle, said in a Fox News interview this weekend that if Republicans don't challenge and change the U.S. election system, there will never be another Republican president elected again. But Trump ally, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, said on ABC News this week. If your basis for not conceding is that there was voter fraud, then show us. Show us. Because if George. you can't show us, we can't do this. Uh, we can't back you blindly. And if they don't come forward with the, with the proof, then it's time to move on. If there are enough charges brought forward, does it sow enough doubt into the democratic process that people feel this entire election should be null and void? I mean, where does the nation end up? Where do voters end up in this process? On the one hand, filing all these challenges does tend to sow doubt, I imagine, in some people's mind about the integrity of the election of the electoral process. On the other hand, if the courts continue to deny all of these challenges, maybe it will help people to feel more comfortable that the election really was on the up and up. There will be a recount in Georgia as the nation waits to see what role the courts will play over the next several days and weeks. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. Keep up with all the latest results and headlines by heading to our Elections 2020 page. That's on njspotlightnews.org. We've got full recaps on all the races, what the public ballot questions will mean for you, and a deeper look at where the vote-by-mail count stands today. President-elect Joe Biden has announced the 13 members of his COVID-19 task force. It includes leading researchers, scientists, and former FDA commissioners. Biden says the team will advise his administration on countering the surge in infections and ensuring vaccines are safe, effective, and available. The president-elect also unveiled Build Back Better, a jobs and economic recovery plan for workers and states as he plans to push for a massive stimulus package to help families and businesses in the COVID-ravaged economy. Many are eager to see how Biden's approach to managing the coronavirus differs from Trump's. That includes NJ Spotlight News health writer Lilo Stanton, who joins us now. Lilo, thanks for joining us. What's the difference between what Biden wants to do and what Trump has done? Yeah, there's a big difference. It really comes down to the ask that, you know, trust the experts. I'm going to listen to science. He says that over and over again, um, which is, of course, a real departure from the Trump administration, which tended to say, you know, we doubt this, I doubt the experts, people are saying um, there wasn't a lot of trend, you know, tendency to look at the data in a holistic way. Um, you know, sometimes data was cherry picked. So I think, I think Biden's, you know, approach is vastly different on that front, um, vastly different. What is Biden's general framing on this? Biden put out a plan a seven point plan sort of that it would outline what he would do to address the virus. And I think just the nature of having that seven point plan in print is different too. Um, it addresses everything from, you know, making sure all citizens have access to, or all residents, all Americans have access to testing um, free for everybody, um, you know, nationalizing PPE, providing uniform guidance for communities, um, it, it, ensuring that vaccines are distrib distributed you know, fairly, um, creating efforts to make sure that at-risk groups like elderly and communities of color are better involved in the decisions and better protected in the outcomes. Um, and, you know, getting in more involved in the international community, including so you could monitor these things early. And then, of course, this mask duty, um, which is something that he really doubled down on, on today, of course, this morning. Lilo, a few seconds left. What does this require of Congress or does he need Congress right. to get approval to get any of this done? Most of it he doesn't, um, with the exception, of course, of funding. And there's $25 million in here for vaccine distribution, but, but which would, of course, require Congress. Um, but it doesn't. And I think the other thing is a lot of it really engages local partners. And that's something that, you know, at least Governor Murphy has said all along is we need, you know, we need, we need more help. We need more communication. We need support, more support and more funding um, from the federal government to help fight this. And there is a lot of 
funding in this plan, but there's a lot he can do without Congress. All right, Lilo, thank you. Thank you. New Jersey lawmakers are wasting no time to legalize recreational marijuana. Lawmakers introduced decriminalization and other marijuana bills on Friday, just three days after voters approved legalization. And today, before the public could barely get a chance to read the bills, lawmakers plan to take action. Senior correspondent David Cruz reports what they've done. It's not vague, it's just not specific, but I think it's clear. Never underestimate the ability of lawmakers to harsh the high of optimists who thought that voting to legalize cannabis would bring millions in sales tax revenue to state coffers and social justice to communities hardest hit by the war on weed. On the first day of a sprint to get enabling legislation passed, panels from both houses, including the Senate Judiciary Committee, were discussing the bills, mainly S-21, the main bill that sets the parameters for the industry. But there was evidence that there's plenty of devil in the details. But we got to get to work because if we don't, in January, this constitutional amendment goes live. And in January, there are no rules attached to this. Advocates for business like Bill Caruso, who co-chaired the yes vote effort, says let's go, hoping to get a jump on the looming New York and Pennsylvania markets. Social justice advocates, though, say the current version of the bill not only won't raise the tax revenues expected, but will actually send the money to police departments. We should set the intention right now to say that the majority of that money is going to go into the communities that have been harmed by the war on drugs, and it's going to go for those social services that we know need, um, need some money, and that it's not, going to go, it's not going to go blindly to police. It does not explicitly make investments in communities harmed by the war on drugs, and even the tax structure that would enable that, um, you know, to really raise the funds so that you can make those investments doesn't exist. To add insult to injury, when you look at the details of the bill, you know, a lot of funds go towards the Cannabis Commission, as it should, because you have to make sure that's up and running and it has the resources it needs. But there's also a lot of funds that go towards police for training. And just to have that while still having nothing, like literally nothing, go towards communities, it is, it is bad optics, to say the least. But we should derail legislation over a fact that we don't have a promise of income yet and, a, and an idea where that's going to go. Moreover, I don't know that these advocates have an idea on really settled where this money should flow. There are broad, broad, broad comments about reparations, uh, impact to afflicted communities, but no meat on the bone in terms of how that money should flow. People will stop getting arrested and jailed and, and getting criminal records as a result of this. That's going to stop. That's the most important aspect of it. The divvying up of the spoils of the program is something that I believe should be done through the budgetary process. The Assembly Speaker raised the idea of an excise tax today, which the governor said he supported. But the Cannabis Regulatory Commission, whose new chairperson is a former ACLU policy counsel, could have the most impact on how the new industry gets off the ground. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. One state legislative battle on last Tuesday's ballot still has no winner. District 25, it's mostly in Morris County, a special election to fill a Senate seat and an assembly seat for full terms. Raven Santana reports the going is slow because of mail-in ballots. While all eyes have been on the presidential race's outcome, Jersey's Legislative District 25 has still not declared a winner six days after the election. And I attribute that to the fact that, one, they just were not really ready for this large number of mail-in votes that we saw this year. Democrat Repunde Meta is facing off against Republican State Senator Anthony Bucco in a special election. Bucco filled his father's seat in the state Senate after he suddenly died of a heart attack in September, but is now running to keep it. That seat got filled with his son, um, and the assembly seat got filled with uh, Ora Dunn. And so as a result of those being filled, they were only appointments that would last by law until the next general election, which in this case happens to be the presidential election. Traditionally a Republican district, it lies mostly in Morris County. Micah Rasmussen, director of the Rebovich Institute of New Jersey Politics at Ryder University, says the race for both candidates may boil down to name recognition. In a lot of the country, people were waiting for a blue wave that never came, but it certainly came here in New Jersey. And for Tony Bucco to be able to um, withstand that, really does give you a sense of the voters' familiarity with his name 
She did extraordinarily well. She had a hidden liability, which was that she has the same last name as the Republican Senate candidate. He was the guy who was running against Cory Booker. You may have thought, oh, there's a matter who I don't, I'm not going to vote for that name. Both candidates have refused to do interviews. Rapunde Mehta released a statement saying votes are continuing to be counted. Clearly, the closeness of this election shows big momentum for the Democratic ticket. The Morris County Board of Elections is working diligently, and we will reserve comment on the results until every vote is counted. Senator Tony Bucco released a statement saying, I respect the work of the Board of Elections staff and understand that as a result of the unprecedented volume of paper ballots due to the COVID restrictions, it means that signature verifications and counting 300,000 ballots will take time. Knowing the results quickly is ideal, but more importantly, we all want the process to be fair and done correctly. I believe the board is doing just that. In our race, we are still expecting approximately 70,000 more ballots to be counted, so we will reserve common and let the board continue their work until the results become clearer, likely into next week. I did reach out to the Board of Elections to confirm when a winner could be declared, but have yet to hear back from them. Until now, we will just have to wait until every vote is counted. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. As we mentioned earlier, President-elect Biden has unveiled his plans for the nation's economic recovery. Rhonda Schaffler has the details and today's top business stories. Rhonda? We heard it on the campaign trail, and now President-elect Joe Biden has formalized his economic priorities on a newly launched transition website. He's pledging to extend unemployment benefits to those out of work due to COVID-19 to provide aid to state and local governments, as well as support for businesses. He also talks about investing in infrastructure and manufacturing and supporting equal pay legislation, among other things. A business tradition in New Jersey has been canceled due to COVID-19. State Chamber of Commerce President and CEO Tom Bracken says the Chamber's annual Walk to Washington event will not be held this February. We managed to keep it going through wars, recessions, storms, many things. Uh, however, we will not be able to continue the tradition this year. Each year since 1937, business and political leaders have been taking the chamber's train to Washington, which ends with a reception featuring the state's congressional delegation. Bracken also joined John Harmon, president and CEO of the African American Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey, to announce a new initiative aimed at ending economic inequality in the business community. Harmon says that will be done by urging New Jersey business leaders to put more African Americans on their boards, to hire and to lend to more black owned businesses. But at the end of the day, if we do this right, the two chambers working closely together, we can improve the overall competitiveness of the state. Bracken, a member of NJ Spotlight News Board of Trustees says it's time to change the status quo. Starting tomorrow, businesses and nonprofits with 100 or fewer employees may be able to get a bigger discount on their purchase of personal protective equipment. They'll be able to apply to the State Economic Development Authority to receive an additional 25% discount on PPE. Right now, businesses are able to receive a 10% discount as long as PPE is purchased through a partnership with several stores, including Staples, Office Depot, and Boxed. Now to Wall Street, stocks shooting up to new record highs on positive news about Pfizer and BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine. I'm Rhonda Schapler, and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by New Jersey American Water, providing water and wastewater services to keep life flowing for more than 190 communities throughout New Jersey and by Junior Achievement of New Jersey, celebrating 100 years as a mission and announcing this year's virtual NJ Business Hall of Fame on November 19th at 6 p.m. The New York Yankees are switching their double-A affiliation from the Trenton Thunder to the Somerset Patriots, a suburban team. 
The Thunder's owner describes Bridgewater as less diverse after the Yankees had pledged a stronger engagement on racial and social inequities. In a statement, the Thunder's owner says, this is about more than baseball. The Thunder is a pillar of the Trenton community. My heart breaks for the thousands of stadium workers, fans, and residents of this great city. This move by the Yankees removes a key source of income for Trenton. Despite repeated assurances that the Thunder would remain its double-A affiliate over the last 16 months, the Yankees betrayed their partnership at the 11th hour. That'll do it for us tonight. I'm Michael Hill for the entire news team. Thank you for joining us. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who keep the Garden State growing. Business leaders. The caretakers of our historic landmarks. And the custodians of our public safety. The people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM. We've got New Jersey covered. I've got cancer. I've got cancer treatments you won't find anywhere else. I've got cancer researchers closing in on a cure. I've got cancer, but I've also got a nurse navigator who's there every step of the way. I've got cancer and I'm fighting it. We're fighting it at New Jersey's only NCI designated comprehensive cancer center. If cancer comes into your life, you'll find the most comprehensive care at RWJ Barnabas Health and Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey.